Hello, my name is Karina Ricker. I am the Reference and Government Information Librarian here at the University at Albany. Welcome to this installment of Librarians with Lattes, a podcast dedicated to being informed, reading, and staying caffeinated. Today, we are recording at the Dewey Graduate Library located on the downtown campus. Our guest is Elaine Lazda, Subject Librarian for Social Welfare, Gerontology, and Reference here at the University. Elaine, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to see you today. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Thanks for making the trip down. So I noticed you have a beautiful purple and green mug over there, and I'm wondering what might be in it. Is there any caffeinated beverage in Absolutely. there? Absolutely. We have a Keurig downstairs, so I have um, uh, 8 o'clock bean. Okay. Is my coffee du jour right now okay. down there, and um, we have reusable Keurig cups to uh -huh. be environmentally conscious, and so I've got that going with cream. Wonderful. So that's down here in the office? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's mm -hmm. a well-equipped office then. That's right. We're, we, we do it right here Wonderful. at Wonderful. Good. <laughs> Well, our topic today is open access, and I understand you're quite versant in open access. What are we referring to when we talk about open access? The best way to explain open access, a lot of people think it's just making stuff free on the internet that is scholarly, or scholarly research that's, they're just making it free. But part of the concept behind the open access movement was much of scholarly research comes from government-funded grants or taxpayer-funded grants, if you think about it, right? If the money comes from the government, it came from the taxpayer. So the taxpayers fund this research, the researcher publishes the research, the results, and then we have to pay thousands of dollars for scholarly journals, and the public who paid for this research does not have access to it. Now that kind of made sense in a print world because you had to have publishing in a journal, you had to have paper, you had to have printers, you had to have ink, you had to have editors, right? And all of that cost money. Distributing the physical copies of the journals, some of that made sense, that there would be a price for the subscription. But now we have the internet and people can put stuff up on the web and there's less of an upfront cost to making and disseminating scholarly journal articles and other scholarly output. So why not make it open? There's, there's definitely a way to make uh, this stuff available to the public who paid for the, the research, you know, through the internet and through online access points. So in other words, we don't want to just call, call it free stuff. Right, because it's not free. Yeah. Somebody paid for the research, and, and some of the open access models require author publishing costs. So, you know, depending on where the open access article shows up, depending on what platform we, we make it open on, sometimes an existing publisher will turn on open access for select articles where they've maybe written the costs into the grant. Mm -hmm. And that would be like $300 in a grant. And then the article in the Sage Publisher Journal is open forever and ever for all eternity. But other people who didn't put that cost into their article, the article's behind what we call paywall, which means it means you have to have a subscription to get the article. And there's a lot of other models. I mean, there's they call it gold open access, green open access, and I think those are the two. If somebody were interested in the details about that, they should come talk to the librarians mm -hmm. because it's not super exciting <laughs> to talk about on a podcast. Okay. But some, sometimes you have to pay, sometimes you don't have to pay. That's okay. to make it open. And some government funders now require open access, like the National Institute of Health on PubMed. If you um, publish and it gets put in the library database or the bibliographic database PubMed, you have to make that article publicly available within a year after publication. That's a federal requirement. So sometimes it's required, sometimes it's just good research ethics, you know? It's not required by your, your discipline, but it's a, it's a good thing to be doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what sort of materials are, can be considered to be open? I heard you say uh, articles. Are there other sorts of materials? Well, we're trying to use the term scholarly output okay. for open content because now what we're seeing is there's a lot of non-journal article. It's not just PDFs, you know, like most people think of research as showing up in a journal article in a PDF form, but now we have some funder requirements of government agencies want you to make your original data set open that you used 
to do the analysis and write the article. So we've got open data, which is different types of file formats. We've got uh, computer code. If you used an interesting algorithm or a code, you know, maybe you put it on GitHub or Figshare and you make it open so that other people can use your code to do calculations based on different data but using your scholarly output of this code. And then we have fine arts people who do art, you know, visual arts and music and interactive stuff that might be, you know, with an aesthetic bent that's not necessarily peer-reviewed PDF article. It might be something you look at and click on or listen to. And then we have the digital humanities stuff. Have you, I don't know, have you seen some of that stuff? Tell me about it. Well, um, we have a guy here, David Hockfelder, who's doing an interactive map where he has a map of Albany and you click on it to see, I don't know if people know what redlining is. It was a way of discriminating, forgiving housing finance and housing, like when they had discriminating based on race, mm -hmm. being in certain neighborhoods and not being allowed to buy houses in certain neighborhoods. And they had the lenders had this red line map, that's what they called it, mm -hmm. and they, he has an interactive map where you can click on a residence in this old map of Albany and see where it fit in some of these tracks, you, you know, because wow. we don't know, I mean, the banks don't tell you what the red lines were, but you can kind of figure it out from his data and his interactive map where the, where the lines of demarcation were in terms of the neighborhoods that were privileged for, you know, white people and, and you know, where black people were stuck, you know? <laughs> what decade is his from data from? Goes from like the early 1900s to mostly 20th century stuff. Oh, you know? fantastic. Yeah, I think so. I'm not 100% sure. It's called like 99acres.com, I think. 99acres something is the URL. But Well, how is the University at Albany involved with uh, providing our patrons with open access materials? Well, the libraries have what we call an institutional repository. That's like the library nerd term for it. And it's a platform, it's like web hosting for scholarly output. So people might say, well, why can't I just put it up on my own website, right? Why do I have to make it open on uh, an re institutional repository for my you know, from my university? Why would I have to do that? And it's because we provide descriptive what they call metadata, which is information about your article or your whatever your scholarship is. And so that makes it what we call discoverable, which means if you search Google Scholar with certain keywords, your stuff will come up and other people will see it. Whereas if you have your own website, it might not be, you know, search engine optimized. Mm -hmm. and, and so our stuff is optimized and our stuff has more descriptions that are more informative and standardized because librarians are really good, as you know, as Organizing. a metadata, yeah. metadata person yourself, <laughs> um, at, at, at standardizing the content and the, the terminology used in that metadata protocol to make it uniform, understandable, accessible to people who want to decide if they want to use it or read it or understand it. And is that what we're calling the Scholar's Archive? Yeah, sorry. Okay. No, it's fine. <laughs> yes, we call it Scholar's Archive. What's in it for the researcher who chooses to share their scholarship via the Scholar's Archive? Well, there's a couple of things. What we found is by broadening open access to publications, there's a lot of scholarly, scholarly, scholarly literature coming out itself saying that if you publish and make your article open, and there's sometimes different versions that you make open, but regardless of what version you publish, you'll have more views, more downloads. Uh, you'll be able to see where people are using your research because a lot of the open platforms like Scholars Archive, but also other ones have maps that show where people are accessing. For some reason, I have an article that's really big in France, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we, we drilled down and we found there's a school, there's a nursing school in France that, that uses this article I did on gerontology. And then there's a librarian here at UAlbany who had one that was in like Nova Scotia or New Brunswick that was being used and they found that it was on a syllabus of a library school course. So people were accessing it that way to read it for their class. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of really good rich information for scholars in terms of their impact. But then the other part is um, what I was starting to tell you before, which is that all of this access does in turn lead to additional citations in scholarly peer-reviewed articles, which is what people want for promotion and tenure. They want to mm -hmm. show 
the impact of their research and that people in their field are building upon it or using it or, you know, giving credit for some additional information that society has now gained as a result of their research, right? Yeah. Do you think that uh, at universities these standards for tenure are becoming more flexible with regard to open access? Have any experience with well, that? Um, Hmm, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Uh, there's some things I would like to see. Mm. Uh, I would like to see that open textbooks counted as a scholarly output for our faculty who, who choose to create a textbook, make it open access for the students, which saves huge money for students. Absolutely. It improves retention, student retention in courses because they don't drop out. They don't avoid buying, buying the hundreds of dollars of text, so they, they do better in the class. They don't drop out, and, you know, it, it's just a really good thing. So that one, I would love to see promotion and tenure requirements modified to incorporate textbooks. So right now, textbooks are considered service okay. instead of research, mm -hmm. and that's kind of academic in ball, but whatever. Yeah. What I tell people if they have open articles and they and they have seen impact that isn't just citation and scholarly peer-reviewed literature like they see that it's being used on a syllabus or they see it's being used you know in some way or it hit the newspaper or um i had a french pharmaceutical guy blog my <laughs> article because he saw it open access right like all these things yeah happen that are impact and i can write them i tell people to write them into their narratives you know how when we do our dossier in mm -hmm, tenure mm -hmm. you write your scholarship narrative i tell people to note that absolutely you know you can't give a statistic from it but you can write about the impact sort of within the context of of your scholarship narrative so great so do we have open access textbooks in our scholars archive Right now we have two. Okay. We have, uh, I think one is accounting and I, the other one eludes me. It's either mathematics or business. They're both kind of uh, topics that the fundamentals don't tend to change over time. But one of them is definitely accounting. And then we have a, a scholar here, P.D. Magnus, who's a philosophy professor. And he was on the bleeding edge of open textbooks. And he has one called For All X, it's a logic textbook. And it's used at the University of Cambridge, been uh, adapted and translated in many languages. It's gone global. It's gone viral almost for a textbook, if a textbook could go viral, mm -hmm. right? So it's, you know, there's some serious influence in regards to that textbook and, and you know, been a, you know, a textbook juggernaut. <laughs> That's great. What does open access mean to the world beyond academia? Well, it means that one of the things we're finding with open articles, let me start with that. One of the things we're finding with open articles is that people go and read something in the paper or their doctor tells them something about a health diagnosis. And they read the study in the New York Times or whatever. They read about the study. They can go get the original study and read for themselves what it actually says, which I don't know if you've experienced this, but a lot of times the article misconstrues the study a little mm. bit. It makes something sound like a definite thing when it's really more like there's a kind of correlation here, but we don't know if it's causing, you know, and yeah. that's why we always hear these like eggs were bad for you now, eggs are right. good for you. But now people can go and they, they have, they're empowered to be able to find that out for themselves. That's the big one is public health, but it's also like policy, you, you know, like if there's a social policy out there, a lot of times there'll be a social science article that talks about the background and you know and, and either corroborates or refutes what the policymakers are saying about that policy or like you know global warming articles like anything like that you can go back to the original research as a human being ordinary citizen you don't have to be some kind of privileged scholar with an academic library at your disposal to get the information you can just go and, and get it so not only would you find the article you'd also find the data Many times, yes. And there's this whole citizen science movement that people can do the data. There's this other thing that other people are concerned about, particularly in some of the social sciences, most especially psychology, is this replicability, which means when you do a scientific experiment, it's supposed to be replicable, so that if I do it, 
and I write out my methodology and I write out where I got my data from and I do the analysis, you can take that information, collect the data the same way, apply the same methodology, you're gonna get similar results. That's supposed to be the thing that happens. But lots of social science stuff, it's really hard to replicate because they do some kind of collection of data in a very unique circumstance. And then people like grow up, you know, or <laughs> they, you know, they change age, they change location, they get married, they get divorced, right? So it's hard to get the same kind of data collected. So you can reuse data, use their data and then apply uh, their methodology. You can verify their data. You can do things to increase the quality and replicability of uh, research in general, which benefits everybody, you know. Very good. What takeaways on open access would you like to offer our listeners? I think the public would be very pleased to know that their taxpayer dollars are being spent wisely. So they, uh, when they hear about open access in the news or they hear about it from a, a library, something like that, they should be supportive and they should be promoting it amongst policymakers. And when these things come up in the public discourse, they, they should be informed and, and supportive of it. And then they should also leverage it to their own knowledge and benefit because most of the stuff is indexed on the internet. There's lots of ways to get at it and, and they can educate themselves and, and um, you know, everybody benefits from an educated public, right? <laughs> and what would you say to our students about open access here at the university? Well, um, the biggest thing for students, I think, is that they learn how to do quality, reliable information discovery in their program of study at UAlbany, right? So they have access to all kinds of paywalled resources, access to all kinds of stuff we pay tons of money for. Yes, we do. They learn how to locate that information, evaluate that information, understand that information, but then we send them off into the world and they have limited access to the same kind of paywalled articles. And a lot of people, like I'm a social work librarian, a lot of people go, what do I have access to once I graduate and there's ways to get stuff but it's convoluted it's you know it requires some legwork and paperwork to get you know special library cards and special libraries and you know it's not always that easy but open access is going to let them get the stuff they need and they're going to have those skills to evaluate the quality of it and they're going to have the skills to locate it and then they can get the research that they were afforded and as you know it was so easy to get here and now they'll be easy to get once they move on into the world and, and are trying to apply it in their professional positions. So open access is really wonderful for researchers who are not affiliated with the university. And globally, uh, developing countries uh, which don't have the facilities to subscribe to paywall journal articles, all that stuff. And we're seeing that. And that, again, raises your impact as a scholar like crazy high because people from all over the world are that's you know we have that open textbook but it's also true with research they can base their research on something uh you know that we put open and then we see the citation back in google scholar and then there's a there's an international cred for your promotion and tenure uh dossier <laughs> wonderful i don't know it's pretty it's pretty cool and and that global you know a lot of the traditional databases that have scholarly articles in them are very Western European and North American focused. And this, this dissolves that, it like just blows it out of the water that we have a global set of information that we're drawing from. And then the other part is um, disciplinary restrictions. You know, right now a lot of the information about scholarly research is contained in disciplinary pockets, kind of, you know, PubMed and mm -hmm. um, Archive, which is an open uh, math and science. So they're in these, they're in these uh, places and they're open, but they're, they're subject specific. But because they're open and because they're indexed in general search engines, you might have written a, what they call a computational behavioral science article. So you have some code that you use to track somebody's behavior psychologically on the web, right? So it's computational, so it's computer science, but it's psychology too. So now the psychologist can find your stuff easily and the computer science person can find your stuff easily without looking for it in places they're not familiar with. Like if they're in their little disciplinary you know, box, 
it's still going to be easier to break down that disciplinary wall and, and foster connections between different fields that you might not have otherwise come across or seen. I mean, that's like a huge part of it is this interdisciplinary mixing. <laughs> I don't know. So for somebody who's on the web, is there a meta site for open access? Well, we don't have a limit. I mean, there are subject specific ones that are open, like PubMed, like Archive. There's one called, and Archive is A-R-X-I-V dot org. Mm -hmm. And then there's one S-O-X-I-V dot org, which kind of copied Archive and it's for social science. But so there are some like that are, that model traditional library databases, but you can just go to scholar.google.com and get most of it. Okay. You, you know, you can. And I know a lot of librarians bristle at Google Scholar, you know, which is what that is called. Um, but number one, it's getting better. And number two, if you have a good, it, like I said, if you were a student at SUNY Albany and you have uh, information literacy knowledge, you know how to sift through the weird stuff or the junky stuff or the poorly annotated stuff and get to the good stuff there. So that would be my argument. Are there any good Google searching tips for finding the open access material? Oh gosh, yes. Um, there are, there's an advanced search on Google Scholar. Love it. Come talk to a librarian about that. It's not too hard to find, but if you can't find it, come talk to a librarian. Um, there's also a thing where you can see who's cited within Google Scholar. It'll have the number, of, like, so you pull up an article like result list in Google Scholar, and then it'll say cited 108 times. If you click on that little link, you get 108 articles that used the original article, right? But then the very cool part about that is you can check a box that says cite within citing articles. So you can put in another like sub search, let's call it, and you can say, like say you did an article, you knew there was a really good article on alcoholism. It was like a fundamental article. It was cited like, I don't know, a thousand times and then you you search that article you click on the cited by you get a thousand articles but you want to find something that's sub category of that you want to find how that article was used in alcoholism as it related to just divorce women or something right so you can put divorce women in your sub search check the box search citing articles and then you get the articles that use that same concepts in the original article but they're only dealing with your subtopic and it's a really powerful way to narrow things down that only a couple very expensive library databases do <laughs> in the same way very expensive library databases but here you can do it for free on Google Scholar you can drill down so, to some really relevant things with a couple shortcuts yeah so the takeaway is come talk to a librarian mm -hmm. great absolutely Elaine, thank you for talking with us today. I'm going to be following the progress of our Scholars Archive. I'd like to end our conversation today by giving you the chance to tell us what you've been reading and enjoying these days. Okay, well, I'm reading two books. Um, one is uh, the Anthology of the Rabbit series by John Updike, Run, Rabbit, Run. Yes. And it's old, but it's good. Um, and then I'm reading this other book that's really interesting. It's about five years old. It's called Laura warholic and i can't think of the name of the author alexander sum sum but um it's almost like james joyce style wow it's very dense but it's amazing and the way it is written is just so quasi realistic quasi surreal i don't know it seems like car you're watching a cartoon but a very intelligent cartoon when you read it i'm totally absorbed in it it's crazy oh, great. good thank you We've been speaking about open access with librarian Elaine Lazda. This is Karina Ricker from the University of Albany Libraries thanking you for checking out Librarians with Lattes, a podcast dedicated to being informed, reading, and staying caffeinated. Thank you all for listening, and remember to read. Read as if the future depends on it, because it does. Thank you.